Welcome to the Did You Know Crypto podcast. Today I'm welcoming Professor Will Luther, who is an extremely thought-provoking, intelligent individual. He's also outside of the Bitcoin bubble that we tend to live in here in this space. And he is, he's been writing about Bitcoin for quite a few years now, and his interest in it as an economist has grown. But he's also somebody that's not 100% sold on it yet. He has a lot of questions, uh, concerns with the ability to for Bitcoin to become a global currency. So I think it's very important that we all listen to these voices that have questions, that have criticisms, because we're never going to grow if we only listen to what we want to hear. And I think you're going to really, really enjoy this interview just as much as I did. If you could head over real quick to supportmypodcast.com, there's all the ways that you can help support the podcast. The biggest way that you can do it is go on iTunes, leave a five-star rating and a written review. It really, really helps. You have no idea how much that helps boost us in the algorithms when anybody's searching for Bitcoin or crypto podcasts. So thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Welcome to the Did You Know Crypto podcast. Today, I'm honored to welcome Professor William Luther, Director of the American Institute for Economic Research's Sound Money Project, Assistant Professor of Economics at Florida Atlantic University. He's also been published in leading academic journals and well-known periodicals such as Forbes, The Economist, and U.S. News and World Report. Professor Luther, welcome to the show. Thanks. My pleasure. Yeah, I'm really glad, you know, that we could make this work. You know, your name uh, was brought up as we kind of talked offline a little bit uh, in my interview with your colleague, uh, Jeffrey Tucker. And uh, we were kind of mostly we were discussing uh, all different stuff about Bitcoin, but also uh, specifically when your name uh, got brought up was about the application of the uh, Mises regression theorem to Bitcoin. But uh, before we actually get into that, I'd, I'd like to first talk to you about, you know, let everybody know who you are. Um, how Bitcoin found you, and you know, if you could kind of go over your early life, what got you interested in economics, and then up through to now? Sure. Well, um, when I got to undergrad, I didn't know anything about economics, which uh, now that I teach undergrads, I've learned is actually pretty common. Um, so I took my first <laughs> economics class when I was, uh, I guess, 18. Um, it was taught by Robert Lawson, who's now at Southern Methodist University, and he works on uh, what's called the Economic Freedom of the World Index. Um, and so naturally, he introduced me to questions of economic growth and how some places are rich and others are poor. And these topics just uh, appealed to me immensely. So I started reading more. And uh, before I knew it, I was an econ major and uh, head over heels for economics and on my way to graduate school. So um, in 2008, I started graduate school at, at George Mason University, where I worked with uh, Larry White. Um, Larry is uh, perhaps best known for his work on uh, the Scottish banking system. He's also uh, um, an expert on the classical gold standard. So um, that's really where my interests in monetary economics took off. And, and also, it turns out how I, how I first learned about Bitcoin. In um, 2010, I was in a monetary economics uh, paper workshop. And my then colleague, Chuck Moulton, presented a paper on this new peculiar internet money that none of us had ever heard of. Uh, Bitcoin was, was trading at something like $3.15 at the time. Uh, so very much in the early days. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's how I first, first heard about Bitcoin. And it, we won't go um, into the the weeds of like specific or re go over what Austrian economics are. If, if any of the listeners are wondering, um, we kind of covered this as well in episode twelve with Jeffrey Tucker, and then in uh, episode fifteen uh, with Bob Murphy as well. So if anybody's kind of wondering from here on out, you know what's Mises regression theorem specifically, or a little bit more overview on Austrian economics, go to those episodes. Uh, but you know what I would have. You know when I talked to Bob and and uh, and Jeffrey, you know that the the Austrian school, and it's obvious when you read, um, you know, the white paper and uh, you know Mises himself was specifically mentioned and 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 Satoshi responded on a thread talking about the regression theorem specifically, um, that he was an influence and in, in the Austrian school. I don't know how well versed he was in it, 
but he was definitely more well-versed than the average person. And he was definitely not someone you'd call from the Keynesian school. Um, Cause I don't think that Bitcoin could ever arise from someone that was coming from that school of thought. I only think that um, someone coming and, and coming from the Austrian uh, school could uh, come up with this sort of idea. I don't know. What, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that uh, it would take an Austrian to do this? Or do you think that Keynesian could maybe stumble his way into it? Well, I, I might come at that from the opposite direction and say that it's, you know, it's somewhat un- unlikely that an Austrian would propose the kind of money that Bitcoin is. Okay. Um, because it would seem to me that the, the kind of monies that, uh, at least traditionally, Austrians like Mises and, and before Mises, Menger, would have been inclined to propose would be some money that has some useful role apart from any role it might serve as a medium of exchange, what we might call n- some non-monetary use. Um, so, so that really gets us to the heart of the regression theorem, which seems to preclude monies that lacks some non-monetary use, um, which I think uh, Bitcoin very much is. Yeah, and I know that that uh, uh, Jeffrey disagrees with you on that point. Um, yeah, and, very much so. <laughs> and 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 uh, Bob Murphy does as well. He actually comes from it from the the the. Uh, um, the point of view that it's actually a fiat money uh, and that we also should not look at the term fiat money just because it has been misused as n- necessarily being a bad thing. Um, and I'm obviously not an economist, just a, a casual observer and reader. But um, as far as for with, with the regression theorem, uh, where do you think that it fits within that? You know, you kind of already explained it just a little bit, but is your contention that um, – that it it doesn't meet his his theorem and is thus not a valid money, or that maybe we should rethink Mises regression theorem in in terms of you know new historical and technological advances. Yeah, so uh, we got two questions there. So why why don't I start just by briefly explaining the the puzzle that Mises was grappling with? You know, today folks like you and I we kind of take it for granted that money is is valuable, but Mises was uh, contributing to this emerging uh, approach to economics, the the subjectivist marginal utility approach to economics that was was pioneered by Menger and Valras and Jevons, uh, and so Menger wants to apply what what he sees as the new standard marginal utility theory to money, and that's it turns out is a little difficult to do. You know, if if you want to figure out why it is that bread is valuable. Well, maybe you consume bread, and so there's some willingness to pay that you have for bread. And of course, in order to consume that bread, you have to bid it away from other people who also have willingness to pay. And so it's not really all that surprising that we can get a positive price for bread, because we're all willing to give up other valuable goods and services for for bread. But with money, none of us uh, consume money in and of itself, that is at least if it's a money that doesn't have any alternative use, it doesn't have any um, uh, non-monetary use, an item that's only useful as a medium of exchange. I accept dollar bills on the expectation that you're going to accept dollar bills. And so that creates a bit of a puzzle. How do we, how do we get a positive price for money, uh, especially a money that isn't useful for anything else, uh, through that same subjective utility uh, approach? And so Mises' um, way of uh, solving this problem was the regression theorem. He said that the money we're using today is valuable because it was valuable yesterday, and it was valuable yesterday because it was valuable the day before that, and so on and so forth, all the way back to some origin point where that item must have had some non-monetary use. Now, that puts him very much in the tradition with Carl Menger's Origins of Money, Right? In Menger's account, we get an item like gold or silver or salt, or salt uh, emerging as money because individuals first use these items. They have some consumption value to folks like you and me. And when we come to market, uh, we find that it might be easier to trade indirectly through one of these items uh, as opposed to trying to find someone who has what we want and wants what we have. 
Uh, so, so in terms of getting an item like gold or silver off the ground, that is getting it some positive value, it has some positive value prior to its use as money. But that's not the case with what monetary economists refer to as intrinsically worthless monies, that is monies that don't serve any purpose other than as a medium of exchange. And so for those monies, you need some other story. Now, now the way that Mises accounted for intrinsically worthless monies like the dollar, he said, well, those monies, they weren't always intrinsically worthless. Uh, just prior to becoming intrinsically worthless, they were redeemable claims. And you could take those dollars to your local bank and, and redeem them for golden or gold or silver that had been uh, deposited. And uh, prior to them being redeemable claims, they were actually fixed weights of some metallic substance like gold or silver. And so uh, they, are, they became intrinsically worthless monies after they had already established some positive exchange value. And so that's how Mises resolved the problem. Uh, and that solution works quite well for traditional fiat monies. It doesn't work that well for, for monies that are launched um, uh, as intrinsically worthless monies. And the, the standard approach, at least to, to Bitcoin, uh, uh, prior to, to Bitcoin, uh, to uh, explaining how an intrinsically worthless item that's never been linked to some uh, 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 item with non-monetary value could get off the ground, was to rely on government support. Government establishes some demand for the money, maybe by taking it in, in taxes or, or requiring people uh, uh, make payments, perhaps through legal tender laws or something like that. But once again, we're in a situation where, although that explanation might explain why, say, the euro circulates, it doesn't seem like a very good explanation for something like Bitcoin, because, of course, there's no government support for Bitcoin. There's no laws that require you to take uh, to pay your taxes in Bitcoin or to uh, extinguish your debts in Bitcoin. Um, and so I think that when it, when it comes to Bitcoin, we need some other explanation for how this uh, uh, item gets off the ground, how it gets a positive uh, exchange value. And uh, so with when we're talking about sound monies, when we're talking about a, you know, a commodity or a back currency, something like, you know, like we had with the with the gold standard, um, is it's. Is its value, um, just to, to clarify, is its value uh, as a money because it has a, a finite amount of it, unlike, say, like, you know, the tulip mania or a, uh, a wheat based, you know, I guess you could still do that. But, the, you know, it would fluctuate so much because you could uh, you can have drought years and all that kind of stuff where there, there's a pretty level amount of gold and silver pulled out of the ground every year. And we, we know, um, you know, there's a diminishing return over time. Um, as we, you know, until I guess, unless we find like an asteroid or something like that, but, but that's kind of like an out there scenario, but is it, uh, to get back to it is, is its value in that it's a finite amount versus, you know, something, even though that does have value can be increased or decreased. So it's probably useful to think, um, both about its initial value and its subsequent value. So at the outset, before anyone is using gold as money, its value is its consumption value, right? People use it for jewelry mm -hmm. or maybe for fillings or something like that. And so whatever that market price is for gold, that's its value at the outset. Uh, once it becomes uh, uh, useful as a medium of exchange, once, once people start uh, using gold uh, to make transactions, there's another source of demand there, right? Another source of demand. And so that's going to uh, tend to put... Uh, uh, upward pressure on the purchasing power of gold. Um, now, the subsequent value of gold is, um, I wouldn't say that it's de determined uh, because it's uh, uh, finite or, or anything like that. It's true that it's, it's scarce. And of course, if it, if it weren't scarce, it, uh, it would be uh, uh, costless. Um, but uh, sometimes folks who are fans of sound money when they're talking about the, the merits of, of using a commodity like gold as money, they, they drift into this uh, view that gold was good because it has a fixed supply. Um, but actually, the, the great thing about a commodity money like, like gold is that it doesn't have a fixed supply. 
it has an adjusting supply, a supply that adjusts to accommodate changes in demand. So if there's a sudden increase in the demand for gold coins, there's actually an incentive for miners to dig deeper, bring more gold to the mint, and melt the uh, and, and produce uh, uh, the coins with that gold to push that purchasing power back down to its long run level. And if there's a contraction in the demand for gold money, there's less of an incentive to dig so deep for for gold, and so you bring less gold uh, to the mint. You mint fewer coins. Uh, uh, than, than would be typical. And the purchasing power tends to rise back up to its long run level. And so that's why when you look at the classical gold standard over long periods of time, the purchasing power of gold was pretty stable. It's because there was an automatic mechanism in place to adjust the supply of gold uh, that approximately stabilized that purchasing power over time. And so it's true that it's scarce, um, but uh, one of the, the merits of, of the gold standard was that the supply was flexible, at least over the, the medium to long term, to offset any uh, purchasing power instability that, um, that came from uh, the demand shock. So it's, it's not an apples to apples comparison, but it's almost somewhat like the, the difficulty adjustment in Bitcoin that as, as it... Uh, um... As it, as it gets more difficult and if miners start dropping off, it'll actually, it'll drop the difficulty for the miners to be able to accommodate or it'll be easier for them to mine so that uh, the network doesn't become less secure. It's not the same because the same amount of Bitcoin is still being produced. That's right. With, with Bitcoin, um, you get a price adjustment, right? So the, the incentives are the same when the, when the uh, um, people enter or exit the production, right? Um, uh, that's similar across both a gold standard and um, a Bitcoin. But the difference is that with, say, a gold standard, you can actually produce more coins. And so that tends to stabilize the purchasing power. So you get a quantity adjustment that stabilizes the purchasing power. With Bitcoin, when more miners enter, uh, you can't, by, you know, uh, by definition, you can't get the quantity adjustment, the the whole point of the difficulty uh, adjusting is to prevent those quantity adjustments. And so since you don't get a quantity adjustment, you get a purchasing power adjustment. And so they're analogous, but the end result is very, very different. That's why with a gold standard over long periods of time, you saw a relatively stable purchasing power. Uh, but with Bitcoin, you see a relatively volatile purchasing power. It's because as more suppliers or miners uh, enter the market with Bitcoin, they don't actually affect the quantity, and so they don't offset any changes in purchasing power. But would you not say the volatility in Bitcoin, especially um, just as an outsider looking in, is one just the well, I mean, the market cap for for Bitcoin. I guess if you want to include the whole crypto uh, world, is is so much smaller than than precious metals. I would imagine that. If the market cap gets to be that size, that that volatility tends to even out a little bit. Although gold can, I remember it with silver was up to like forty dollars an ounce back in twenty eleven, uh, kind of riding the coattails of the of the OA crisis. So I mean, metals can be quite volatile at times too, just to due to, to speculators running in when they see volatility starting to occur in a specific market. Well, you're right that you know the demand for for Bitcoin is relatively small. That is relative to other large international markets, it's still relatively small. And so, any one person's decision to enter or exit that market has a bigger effect than it than it does, say, for the market for dollars. If you enter or exit the market for dollars, no one's going to notice, right? And so, uh, sometimes I compare this to to dropping a rock into the ocean versus dropping a rock into the to a small bucket of water, right? The demand shocks in the in the market for Bitcoin are are going to have much bigger ripples than demand shocks in the market for dollars. Another another uh, factor here um, gets us back to that idea of of government support, demand support. So you know the U.S. government is a big user of U.S. dollars, and U.S. taxpayers are a big user of of U.S. dollars. And anyone else in the world can be pretty confident that all of the U.S. government transactions and all of the tax payments are going to take place in, in dollars. And so that's a big, stable source of demand for the dollar. 
And so the range of fluctuation and demand that you can get, given that you have this big stable source, is much smaller than it would be uh, for a currency like like Bitcoin, even if it were the same size, uh, even if it had the you know a similar market cap to the dollar, because the the source of demand isn't as stable as as a money that that some people are required to use for some uh, transactions, and so uh, that gives a, a, a some um, scope for a more uh, a bigger potential for volatility as well. I guess one one could almost say um, it's probably quite a naive point of view that maybe the uh, Bitcoin's value is derived from kind of like a an inverse. What we were talking about with with fiat currencies, where they derive their value from the fact that the government's backing and telling you that's what you pay for taxes, is that maybe it derives its value from the fact that it's like an inverse of an actual fiat, where it's uh, it can't be uh, prescribed, required, or or um, censored in any way. But it it is a peculiar. I don't. I, I you know just talking with Jeffrey and and Bob as well is that it's it it is a peculiar thing, especially because I. I started to learn about Austrian economics before I learned about Bitcoin, but it was roughly around the same time. So, I, I, you know, I was a uh, I got into kind of the gold bug phase, as I think a lot of young people do when they, you know, two thousand eight. Ron Paul started going, you know, what's this, and started to learn about, you know, what's all. Oh, wait, wait, who's this Mises guy? And and uh, started to read, you know, that that type of literature. Uh, I think a lot of us jumped into kind of gold bug phase, and when Bitcoin came around, um, being kind of uh, but definitely plugged into more tech uh, than I was, you know, a lot of the people that I talked to that were, you know, old, you know, in, in the older uh, side, you know, like the Peter Schiff kind of generation as well, uh, where it was very much gold as a, as a constant. Um, it was hard for me to peg down. I, I still haven't been able to quite figure out where it fits. And, and um, I don't think that it uh, specifically meets Mises regression theorem, which like, you know, as we've been talking about, it kind of makes me question then, do we, you know, and I, I know it probably is hard for people who study this their whole lives and kind of, you know, are, are in these worlds to kind of go like, maybe this isn't necessarily something that, um, you know, meets the definition of something that has guided us for a long time. But um, it's it's definitely something very peculiar. And I don't necessarily know what exactly it is yet. I think we have quite a bit more time before we really figure out how this is going to, you know, the impacts that this is going to have on society, but that could just be naive, uh, youthful, you know, utopianism too as well. So, so let me, um, let me, let me take on a couple, uh, what I think of as, as, uh, naive or wrong views before, uh, we think a bit more about, you know, whether Bitcoin satisfies the regression theorem or what Bitcoin means for the regression theorem. Okay. The first is, is just considering whether Bitcoin is a money. So certainly in the early days of Bitcoin, when, when folks who were familiar with the regression theorem uh, looked at Bitcoin, many of them said, well, this doesn't meet the regression theorem, therefore it is not money. Um, but that's actually, a, um, to put it bluntly, a, a sloppy way of reasoning. Uh, economists define money as a commonly accepted medium of exchange. And so if we look out into the world and see an item that is a commonly accepted medium of exchange, then by definition, it's a money. Now, if it happens to be the case that that money conflicts with the regression theorem, that doesn't mean that the item isn't money. It means that there's something wrong with the regression theorem. Uh, the, the definition of money is not that it satisfies the regression theorem. The definition of money is that it's a commonly accepted medium of exchange. Now, what Mises was arguing quite explicitly was that um, at least for a privately issued money, that is a money that doesn't have government support, a money that wasn't created by divorcing um, uh, redeemability as, as many of our monies uh, were, uh, our fiat monies were created, uh, that it was a prerequisite that it first had some non-monetary use. So that's Mises' argument in a nutshell. If an item is going to become a money, it must first have some non-monetary use. He argued that if it doesn't have some non-monetary use, it never functions as a medium of exchange. And if it never functions as a medium of exchange, it can never function as a commonly accepted medium of exchange. And so therefore, it never becomes a money. Um, and so uh, the, the idea that if Bitcoin doesn't 
satisfy the regression theorem, therefore it isn't money, doesn't quite follow, right? The question in terms of whether Bitcoin is money is whether it's a commonly accepted medium of exchange. If we say, yes, it's a commonly accepted medium of exchange, it's a money. Now, some people will go a step further and say, well, you know, Bitcoin is a medium of exchange, but it's not commonly accepted. And so uh, it, it can't possibly re, um, uh, uh, conflict with the regression theorem because the regression theorem is about money. But think again about that chain of reasoning that Mises was employing. If an item does not first have some non-monetary use, then it can't function as a medium of exchange. And if it can't function as a medium of exchange, then it can't function as a commonly accepted medium of exchange. And so the regression theorem, although it does have uh, some prediction about what items can become money, it's actually much stronger than that. It has predictions about what items can serve as a medium of exchange. And in particular, it rules out items that don't have some prior non-monetary use. And so that argument that um, uh, as long as Bitcoin is a medium of exchange and not a commonly accepted medium of exchange or money, it doesn't violate the regression theorem. That doesn't quite work either because the regression theorem deals specifically with media of exchange, not merely commonly accepted medium of exchange. Now, the last um, uh, kind of uh, you know, naive view that I, I want to take on just to clear the table here so we can have maybe a, a, a more sophisticated conversation about this uh, topic uh, sometimes um, when, I, when I tell people that um, uh, Bitcoin uh, you know, violates the regression theorem because it's intrinsically worthless, and I'll use that term intrinsically worthless, they'll say, well, you know, that's nonsense because everything is intrinsically worthless because value is subjective. And that's true, but uh, it's also just a semantic point. When monetary economists use the term intrinsically worthless, they're not referring to an item that lacks some objective value in and of itself. Pretty much all modern uh, economists embrace the idea that value is subjective. What they mean by intrinsic worth is just some value apart from any role that the item serves uh, as money. Uh, so some non-monetary use value. So for something like gold or salt or silver, right, gold, that would be like jewelry or fillings, salt, right, you can use that to preserve meat or to make your food taste better. Um, but items like the dollar don't have that readily non-monetary uh, use value. And so we call those monies intrinsically worthless, not to deny subjective value, but rather to just denote that it doesn't have any subjective non-monetary value. It's only useful as a medium of exchange. And so there's kind of a, uh, a confusion of language there that uh, some people slip into. Uh, so I call that the, the, um, the uh, simplistic subjective value view. Um, nobody is denying subjective value when they talk about an intrinsically worthless item functioning as money. So we've kind of cleared the, the stage here um, and, and we have a better understanding of what Mises' regression theorem is. And so we should, we should probably think about how it is that, that Bitcoin relates to uh, this regression theorem. How is it that we can have an item like Bitcoin that functions as a medium of exchange, has a positive exchange value? Um, is that consistent with the regression theorem? And I think that there are basically two ways that we can resolve this, this problem. The first is the way that's preferred by folks like Conrad Graff. Uh, and Graff says, well, Bitcoin, it had some non-monetary value before it was useful as a medium of exchange. Um, people were in a small community and this peculiar thing, Bitcoin, it served like a, like a badge of honor among some, uh, some developers. Right? It, it indicated that you were part of the club. And so that was some source of non-monetary value. It wasn't useful as a medium of exchange. Nobody was accepting it. But some people wanted it uh, just in and of itself. And I confess that there's, there's something to this view, especially when you think about other monies like gold or, or silver. Right? A lot of the uses that we think of for gold and silver today weren't historical uses for gold and silver. 
and gold and silver uh, essentially amounted to to being used as mere trinkets, right? Things that kind of look pretty. Um, and so that's a, a pretty small use value, um, uh, but it's a positive use value. And so according to the regression theorem, that's all you need is a, a positive use value to get an item off the ground. I think that that's a, a possible way of resolving the regression theorem uh, in, in light of Bitcoin. But the problem is that in saving the regression theorem, right, in, in saying that the regression theorem still holds, you also completely erode its, its predictive power. If suddenly items that have such trivial use values, uh, uh, if that's enough to satisfy the regression theorem, it's no longer clear that the regression theorem rules anything out. And what stops a uh, uh, a, a paper money, right? A paper money that's not redeemable for uh, any underlying commodity. It's just ink and paper and maybe a, a picture of a, a dead president or uh, some patron saint or maybe some animals, right? Just some piece of, of monopoly money. What stops that from functioning as, as a commonly accepted medium of exchange, right? There's a, you know, there's a, the International Banknote Society um, has a, a, a regular issues that it puts out where that people subscribe to. They seem to enjoy looking at these notes and evaluating them. They find them aesthetically appealing. And so surely that would be sufficient use value to get what traditionally we would call intrinsically worthless monies, irredeemable paper monies, off the ground. And so if you take that graph approach and say that that Bitcoin had some use value, it was valuable as, a, as some trinket or a badge of honor, that, that works. You've saved the regression theorem, but in saving the regression theorem, there's just not much left in terms of what it precludes from being money. Uh, and so I, I find that kind of unsatisfying. Hey, I hope that you are enjoying listening to this episode as much as we did recording it. I don't have any sponsorships. So I'd really appreciate it if you go over to iTunes, rate and review it five stars if you think I'm worthy of it, or wherever you're listening to the podcast right now. Um, if you could also go to our Twitter, our Facebook, our Instagram, you know, any of the social media pages that we have, like and share them. It really helps spread the word. So once again, thanks for listening and enjoy the rest of the show. Yeah, it's it's uh, it, it's interesting when you talk about the the. Uh as far as for, I guess you'd, you'd say aesthetic art value. Um, and, and, and when you going back to where you're talking about, you know, just uh, finding uh, or, or people just saying without their, that, um, that it's subjective, that uh, people's idea of what, you know, of, of value being subjective. It's that, that's one of the things you run into. I, I'd say it's, it's less from uh, it, it's mostly kind of the internal disputes where you kind of get into the, um, um, subjective value theory with, uh, and it's mostly people who uh, reject Bitcoin um, on the basis of, of mostly just because they are they are very attached to gold for whatever reason. Um, that they that's usually what at least what I've heard in some of the uh, discussions, if you want to call them that, um, on Twitter and elsewhere, where, where I've heard that. But uh, if um, if you don't mind, if we move away from the Russian theorem just a little bit um, into uh, um, into Hayek. Um, in, on, in December, I think it was, it was, uh, it was last December, you wrote an article about the, about Hayek's book, the denationalization of money. Um, and you know, in that book is, is where he had proposed, you know, privately issued monies to compete with, with, uh, you know, national currencies. And, uh, you know, to me, I, I would say that that's kind of what we're seeing right now. It's kind of the Hayekian perspective, um, where conversely, Rothbard and I talked uh, with with Jeffrey about this as well is that Rothbard vehemently you know disagreed uh, with Hayek on that idea because basically in, in a very too long didn't read explanation is that Rothbard thought you know what's going to stop this guy that you know from First National Bank from who owns First National Bank bucks from just printing a bunch and enriching himself at the expense of those who are using them? Would you say that that Bitcoin is kind of the triumph of the Hayekian view? over Rothbard and would Rothbard have changed his mind on that in, in view of the, you know, the latest developments in technology? 
Well, I'm not sure if I would say it's the, the triumph of a uh, Hayekian view. Maybe it's the uh, innovation or extension of uh, the view initially proposed by Hayek. So what you have to keep in mind is Hayek, he not only said that we would have a, um, privately issued monies that were irredeemable, but he specified a precise mechanism whereby uh, those, those monies would be governed. So Hayek thought that private issuers, uh, in order to maintain their circulation, that is, in order to persuade people to use their monies, um, would stabilize the purchasing power of those monies. And the mechanism he had in mind was switching effects. If you're using a particular money and the, uh, and, and the, the purchasing power of that money is not very stable, uh, Hayek thought you had some, an, an incentive to switch some, to some other more stable money. Now, there are three problems with this view. Uh, first, it's not clear, it's not obvious that individuals would prefer a money that has a stable purchasing power. Perhaps they would rather have some money that yields a positive return compared to some other safe assets. Perhaps they would prefer a money that stabilize, not, stabilizes uh, something like nominal income or nominal spending. Uh, and so it's just a bit arbitrary for Hayek to assume at the outset that it's purchasing power stability that money holders care most about. Second, if we think about that mechanism, uh, whatever it is that the issuer is trying to stabilize, purchasing power, nominal income, whatever it is, um, the thing that governs that decision, according to Hayek, is the, the user switching from one money to another. But one of the things about monies that we should keep in mind is that they're subject to what economists call network effects. When I woke up this morning, I didn't think about what money I was going to use because I knew that anywhere I stopped on my way to work, the money that, my, that, that any of those trading partners would be uh, readily willing to accept would be dollars. And so I want to be in that dollar network. Uh, it, it, it doesn't make much sense to use the money that no one else is using. You want to be in the same network, uh, uh, the same monetary network as, as all of your trading partners. And that makes people very reluctant to switch from one money to another. So when I was at GMU, I, I wrote my dissertation on the monetary system of Somalia. And one of the interesting things is that although Somalia had a relatively crummy uh, money, um, when the government ceased to exist in 1991, the central bank was bombed and looted. The notes were not being replaced because there was no central bank to replace them. They become worn and tattered and smelly, and people kept using them. Why did they keep using them? Well, because all of their uh, local trading partners were still using them, and so they readily expected that that was going to continue. And of course, by, by continuing to accept it themselves, they made it more likely that other people would continue to accept it. And so there's some real staying power uh, with monies. Uh, that, that's because of that uh, network effects problem. So there are two problems. Let's think about the third. The third is that Hayek, and this is uh, what Rothbard gets at, and he wasn't alone in getting at, the, at, at this, but um, the idea that Hayek doesn't seriously address the, the incentive to renege on the agreement. So it may be the case that individuals prefer a money with a stable purchasing power. And uh, it, so it might be the case that issuers will have to commit to stabilizing the purchasing power at the outset in order to get anyone to use this money uh, to begin with. But once that circulation has been maintained, there is no longer an incentive to maintain a stable purchasing power. Right? Once you have a base of users, your incentive actually becomes right, produce more of them. Right? This is, these monies that Hayek had in mind are very different from the kind of paper monies that circulated historically, paper monies that were redeemable for some underlying commodity. Those monies didn't depend on, on switching between users. They depended on redemption. As long as you could reliably expect that you could show up and uh, redeem that, the, uh, those notes for the underlying gold or silver, 
you would hold them. And of course, the issuer had to hold sufficient gold or silver in order to satisfy those redemptions, or else they would suffer reserve losses to other banks, and pretty soon they would find themselves out of business. With Hayek's monies, they're irredeemable monies, so there's no redemption requirement that keeps the issuer honest in the long run. We just have to trust that the issuer is going to do the right thing. And although the issuer might have an incentive to do the right thing at the outset, once the circulation is established, the incentive disappears. And so there's a big incentive to renege on that initial promise. So what cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin uh, do that Hayek hadn't envisioned is it takes that promise of the issuers and it codes it. It makes it uh, um, uh, difficult, perhaps even impossible to, to break that commitment. And so when you issue the cryptocurrency, you define the supply mechanism. And then at some later point, perhaps your incentives are different and you would like to change that supply mechanism. But because you've hard coded it, you can't renege on that promise. And so the reason I say that it's an innovation on Hayek or maybe it's the denationalization of money 2.0 or something like that is because cryptocurrencies have found a way to credibly commit um, to, to maintain some uh, supply mechanism in a way that Hayek did not envision. So he had them committing, but they weren't credible commitments. They were incredible commitments. Uh, with cryptocurrencies, you have credible commitments. So that seems to me to be a significant improvement on Hayek's proposal. Do you think that Rothbard would have changed his view? Do you think he had so many issues um, with it outside of of just that uh, the issue of issuance that he probably would still you know I, I, yeah I, I mean I realize that this is just a you know do do you think that somebody we can't talk to and have no idea what they would have thought what would they would have thought but uh, I just thought it was a an interesting thought experiment for someone that's you know kind of in in the in the in the same world as they were. You know, I'm, I'm not sure, right? I think that, uh, I suspect that um, Rothbard would have been skeptical of, of Bitcoin for, um, you know, for being a, a money that violates the regression theorem. Um, but, uh, you know, whether or not he would come around on that, I'm not sure. Fair enough. Um, in moving kind of um, into, into the political uh, spectrum of things is that... Uh, I might be butchering his name, David Columbia and, and Nuro Rabini uh, have both made the assertion um, that it, it, I'm heavily paraphrasing, you know, their position, but they made the assertion that Bitcoin is nothing, uh, but pretty much just software created in the dreams of quote unquote, right wing extremists. Um, yeah. I, I'm wondering what, what would you have to say in regards to those claims? Uh, I mean, obviously we, we probably both don't agree with that at all. Um, and I think that's just kind of superfluous. Uh, just character attacks, just so they don't actually have to talk about the actual technology. But uh, I was just wondering if you wanted to comment on that. Well, I, I reviewed uh, Columbia's book, The Politics of Bitcoin, um, and I, I wish that there were nice things that I could say about it, but uh, I, I thought it was a, a pretty poor argument. Um, for one, it just shows a lack of understanding of, of basic uh, modern uh, um, monetary economics. Um, the idea that that Bitcoin is right wing extremism, uh, first of all, the way that he defines right wing extremism is a bit odd. Uh, you have to keep in mind that folks like Hayek and, and Milton Friedman, they saw themselves not as right wingers, but rather as working in the, the tradition of John Stuart Mill. Right? They're liberals. Uh, and so, I mean. Or you have Hayek pinning why I'm not a conservative. So, so the idea of, of you know, Bitcoin being software is right-wing extremism because it's in the, the, the image of, of the kind of monies preferred by folks like Hayek and Friedman is, is just a, um, an indication that you're, you have a very narrow uh, view of political philosophy. Okay, today we have progressives on the left and conservatives on the right, but in the past, we had we had classical liberals, right? And it was the classical liberal tradition. Um, 
uh, you know, prior to uh, the progressive wing breaking off, right? It's that classical liberal tradition that folks like Hayek and Friedman were working in. So they weren't right wingers. Um, so that that's a problem at the outset. Uh, another problem with Columbia's book is that he thinks that, that um, modern monetary economics is uh, um, uh, represented by uh, what's what's known today as MMT, modern monetary theory. But as I point out in my review, that that name is a, a misnomer <laughs> um, because modern monetary theory, one, it's it's not modern. It uh, stems from the work of, of George Knapp. Uh, and so it's more than 100 years old. That's hardly modern. Uh, and it's, it's not modern in the sense that most monetary theorists today subscribe to modern monetary theory. Quite the opposite. There are very few economists outside of UMKC, the University of Missouri at Kansas City, the New School, or UMass Amherst that, that subscribe to modern monetary theory. And so uh, that, that just shows a, a lack of, of understanding of, of actual modern monetary economics on the, on the part of Columbia. Uh, and so, yeah, I wasn't very impressed with the book. I don't think that cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin in particular is uh, especially right wing. I think that it's, uh, you know, it's, it's liberal. Uh, in the classical sense of the of the word, that is promoting freedom, um, to the extent that folks on the right find that appealing, okay, right? Some folks on the right do value freedom, uh, but that's not a value that's limited to folks on the right. There are plenty of folks on the left who value freedom as well, uh, and so it doesn't strike me as being especially right wing. No, I think, and especially the case of, of uh, Nuriel, I think uh, he's just been on a tear lately. I don't know if you caught his SEC. I think it was SEC or if it was CFTC um, where he, he went on and he was, uh, 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 he, he was actually pretty, he brought up some really good points. Uh, I think the problem with him is that he does bring up good points about the space in general, not about necessarily Bitcoin. Uh, but the space in general and the issues that we have with, you know, th there are a lot of scammers and shysters that come in, but it usually comes in whenever there's, and I don't think it's a bad thing, but quote unquote, the lack of regulation, whatever you want to say, um, in a really a nascent space where there's, uh, w where it's it's still so young, there's not a lot of built in institutions that, that people kind of, you know, know to go to off the bat, right. Um, to learn what's, you know, good and bad and what's proper, um, you know, you know, what's, what's a, a good, you know, proper ways of behavior, I guess, in a way, if you want to call it that in, in the space and, and kind of get, especially when you get caught up in these run-ups. But I, I do think that he does have some, uh, good points in regards to, uh, the kind of the bad aspects that can be brought up in when you have the quote unquote wild West in a new space. I don't think that there's bad. I don't think that regulation's good. Um, I think it'll only slow down uh, Bitcoin's uh, march forward. But uh, in the spirit of recognizing issues in the space, do you see any dangers of, of a Bitcoin? May, and not specifically talking about the scams or anything, but how a cryptocurrency or Bitcoin in general, that there could be dangers, you know, to society, you know, found in this technology? Absolutely. I mean, it would be crazy to think that there weren't, right? You show me an industry and I'll show you an industry where there are some fraudsters and hucksters. You show me a technology and I'll show you a technology that some people use to commit crimes. A regulation doesn't stamp out fraudsters and hucksters. It doesn't prevent technologies from being uh, used by criminals. Right? If, if you uh, open up the paper, you might see a headline that says something like, you know, uh, $30,000 worth of Bitcoin seized in, uh, you know, uh, ID scam operation. Um, and that would make uh, headlines, right? But you would never see a headline that say, says something like, uh, uh, ID scam ring busted using dollars, right? Of course that happens as well, right? But it doesn't make the headline because it's not so special that they're using dollars. We use dollars for lots of things. And so, yes, criminals also use dollars. Will criminals use Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies? Sure. Uh, probably to the same extent that they're using dollars, right? 
Will there be fraudsters and, and hucksters uh, in the cryptocurrency space? Absolutely. Just like there are folks calling me up to get me to make payments to the IRS through Western Union, that is, to them. Uh, but we don't think that the solution to preventing IRS scams is to regulate the IRS. And so why is it that we would think that regulating Bitcoin is going to have any major effect on, on Bitcoin scams? Right? There's fraud in the world. We should take efforts to deal with, with fraud. Uh, but, but regulation oftentimes doesn't really take that head on. I forgot to ask this right at the beginning when you were talking about um, uh, when, when you first heard about Bitcoin. But w when you did first hear about it, what was your initial reaction? Um, and and uh, I, I imagine most people, you know, I, I don't really know anybody that ever the first time they heard of it was like, wow, this sounds like a great idea. Right. Most people's first reactions were like, oh, you know, this is just going to get copied and scammed, <laughs> going to be stolen or whatever. But what was your first reaction to it? And then obviously, you know, you, you've, you've come around from probably whatever that first initial reaction was. What changed your mind? Um, what, what was the kind of that that light bulb that that went off for you? Well, I was you know, I was very much a naysayer at the outset uh, and I would still consider myself, uh, you know, somewhat skeptical on the extent to which that's going to be used. But you have to keep in mind that, you know, I'm a monetary economist. And I think very hard about the, the network effects uh, for money. Uh, they're very difficult to overcome. You know, Friedrich Hayek and Milton Friedman um, had a debate about this uh, in the context of the denationalization of money. You know, Friedman said, well, you're, you're missing the whole point of these uh, network effects, which discourage people from switching. And, and Hayek said, well, you know, uh, the, the reason we don't see much switching is because of uh, government restrictions. And in fact, when we look around the world today, even with, with places that don't have severe or, or any restrictions on um, uh, which currency you can use, you don't see most people shopping around for, for currencies, right? They use the same currency everyone else does. And so when you tell me about this upstart money that basically nobody is using, and you tell me that it's going to revolutionize global payments, yeah, I was a little skeptical, right? How's it going to overcome... The, the network effects problem. Um, but, you know, it, it has to some extent overcome those network effects problems. There's some entrepreneurs in this space that made it much easier to use uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. It leveraged existing technology uh, to, to, make, to make transfers and, and intermediaries in the space uh, intermediaries in this space stand at the ready to exchange your Bitcoin for dollars or euros or uh, renminbi or whatever the case may be, um, and and vice versa, so that if you just want to make transactions with Bitcoin, you don't have to worry about whether your trading partner uses Bitcoin because there's an intermediary who will convert Bitcoin to whatever currency they want to use. Uh, and so those are things that I, I didn't fully appreciate at the outset, you know, before they had had developed that as I began to look at the space a bit more, I, I came to appreciate. Now, with that said, I think that uh, uh, Bitcoin and and uh, now now if if we think about the blockchain technology more broadly, uh, these these items are often prone to what I call the all or nothing fallacy. So the idea that that Bitcoin is uh, either going to be the end-all, be-all money that replaces all monies, or it's going to be absolutely nothing. Um, I think both of those extremes are somewhat ridiculous. Um, it seems much more likely to me that there will be some transactions where an item like Bitcoin could, could function quite well as a medium of exchange. It uh, has some advantages that other monies don't have. And so it'll be used in those transactions. But there are other transactions where we don't care so much that we have a, an immutable ledger. We, we can trust our trading partners. Um, or maybe we can't trust our trading partners. And so we want access to a, to a payment technology that's reversible. Um, and so in those transactions, I think that we wouldn't want an item like Bitcoin. We would want some other uh, medium of exchange. And so uh, I think that 
Um, whereas I was a maybe a hard skeptic at the outset, now I'm a bit more of a, a moderate, um, and and most mostly just uh, arguing with folks who are on one side or the other of the all or nothing fallacy. No, that's great. Uh, I, I I really value talking to people because uh, we get no matter where we are, we, you know, we're always in danger of falling into these bubbles uh, where we only talk to people that uh, are, you know, kind of in the same mindset as we are. So I always find it really, really valuable to talk to to folks that uh, that, you know, you know, maybe not extremely against it because that can be quite counterproductive at times, but people that still <laughs> you know, questions and going like, well, what about this? And I find it very interesting as well, where you talk about the all or nothing is that um, there is that, that th those two frames of thought within the, the larger crypto community, especially within Bitcoin, there's definitely a group of folks who believe, you know, once we hit what they call hyper Bitcoinization very quickly, um, once we hit that point, you're going to see, you know, it adopted as a global currency and eventually you know, given enough time in the macro, you're going to see everyone go to the most reliable form of money. Um, other people, and and I, I've started to tend to, to agree with with uh, people like Vin Armani as well, where he talks about is you know Bitcoin's an infinite infinite game, and to say that one thing is one uh, one over everything else is to say like the game has ended, and and since there you know the the game never ends, and and in that sense, there's always going to be uh, competing monies. Uh, within you know the world, not just Bitcoin, but um, and mixed I, monies, right? We we use yeah. money for different things, and so uh, you know you go to a hardware store, you don't find one kind of hammer, right? Uh, there are specialty ham hammers for lots of different hammerings, um, and so why should we expect a medium of exchange environment to be any different? Here's the analogy I like to make. So when I when I teach my principal students about money. I tell them that barter is difficult. And so, you know, it's really hard to find someone that has what you want and wants what you have. And so that's why we use money. Um, and that's great for explaining to principal students why we, why we use money. But if we think about that a bit more, yeah, barter is complicated. It's difficult, but not always. I mean, there are many aspects of our lives where we effectively engage in barter. Right? It's because on the margin, barter is actually not so costly in those particular circumstances. You don't charge your kids for Cheerios. Right? Most uh, uh, couples aren't making uh, explicit payments to one another. You, know, you take out the trash and I'll do the dishes. We engage in a barter there. Right? We're not using money for those transactions. And the reason is because we have access to other technologies. Right? Technologies like trust and reciprocity, and those technologies function quite well for many exchanges in what Hayek referred to as the intimate order. It's in the ex extended order where those mechanisms don't work very well and where we might need access to some technology like a money. Uh, and so surely we could reach a similar argument um, when we think about the types of monies we use. We don't use the same types of monies in all transactions, right? Sometimes I really value my financial privacy. I don't want people to know, uh, maybe I don't want my bank to know what I'm purchasing or uh, if you're married, maybe you, you're you buying a gift for your, for your spouse and you don't want her to, to see the transaction hit your Chase account. Uh, and so you use cash. But in other transactions, the financial privacy isn't of much concern. And so maybe you'll use your, your debit card or, or if you're old like me, you'll write a check, right? And so for different uses, we have access to different media of exchange and some media of exchange are more useful for some purposes and other media of exchange are more useful for others. And so the idea that we need one all, uh, all encompassing money, I think is, uh, uh, you know, just, uh, doesn't doesn't ring true to me. I think we're much more likely to see niche monies uh, um, being used. And and the last question I wanted to, to to end on was where do you see Bitcoin going from here? And I guess the last two questions, but I'll throw a second one in there. But what is the biggest thing that you see uh, people within the Bitcoin space missing? Like what, what you know from from um, 
your point of view, what is the like the biggest mistake that we're making? Um, and I know it's a very general term for a lot of people, but um, kind of a glaring thing that you see in the space of going like, you guys really need to focus on this or stop focusing on that. Well, I think that the um, the supply mechanism of Bitcoin is a little problematic. Um, I really like the, the classical gold standard uh, mechanism where the supply uh, adjusts to accommodate changes in demands. In fact, to the extent that I have um, uh, problems with the classical gold standard, it's that that supply mechanism didn't work fast, fast enough, right? That maybe it would take a, a decade for the adjustment to fully uh, take place. And so it was very good for le- anchoring long-term contracts. Um, but in the short term, you're subject to some pretty severe purchasing power instability. Um, Bitcoin on that margin is even worse. You don't get any supply adjustment. Uh, the, the, um, all of the demand shock shows up in, in price volatility. And so I think that makes it a little difficult to engage in long-term contracting now. You know, we have futures markets now, so that that helps with that. But uh, still, you know, when we're comparing one money to another, I would rather have a money where the supply adjusts to accommodate changes in demand. And and Bitcoin just doesn't do that. Uh, And so I think that it's a a problem when folks in the Bitcoin community herald this as um, as the the desirable feature of Bitcoin. Um, I tend to think of it more as a, a weakness of Bitcoin. Maybe not an insurmountable weakness, but a weakness nonetheless. Well, I, I really appreciate you taking you know your time to come on the show and uh, come on the podcast here. Where can uh, people find you and get a hold of you? Well, I'm on Twitter, William J. Luther, and uh, I write regularly at the American Institute for Economic Research as part of the Sound Money Project there. Um, so feel free to, to follow along and, um, you know, uh, at mention me or, or, or comment on some of the threads. I'm happy to, to talk about these topics uh, at length. Well, thanks again. And I'll uh, have links to basically everything that we talked about, all the articles, episodes, um, as well as all your contact information in the show notes, as well as in the tweet that goes out. It'll be in one of the subtweets if you're listening to this. And, uh, you know, once again, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. 